fall of 1984, a cutting-edge cop show exploded onto television screens across America. We just had everything. We had the clothes, we had the sound, we had the music. It said hit, written all over. Miami Vice had sizzled. Vice in the 80s took advantage of the, you know, free will and lifestyle and, and spend, 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 and money and flash and glamour. Miami Vice had sex. Don and Philip were like the most gorgeous guys I had ever met, just drop dead gorgeous. Miami Vice had style. But suddenly you did start to see guys wearing the t-shirt, the jacket, maybe going beltless. In the next hour, we'll transport you to Miami circa 1985 and take you behind the colorful exteriors of South Beach into the world of Miami Vice. You'll meet the stars. It's very hard to look at either Don Johnson or Philip Michael Thomas in any other way but as uh, Sonny Crockett and Ricardo Tubbs. People with limited imagination will probably draw whatever conclusions they want to draw, but Don Johnson's never been a cop. The co-stars. Knucklehead comes to the door. Yeah? Oh, that's right! I gotta go to Miami! The sound department would say, excuse me, Eddie, but it's intense. It's hard to get you. I said, good. And then, but, but it's gonna be hard to hear you in television. I said, good. And the guest stars. I was gonna play a swarthy kind of a guy in pajamas surrounded by beautiful babes. Wasn't so bad. I was usually isolated with Philip most of the time. Well, that was fine with me, because like I said, he smelled good and he's a great actor. You'll hear about the good times. People are giving you things. You walk into a restaurant in Miami and your meal was free. And the bad. Don didn't want to come out of his trailer. And I screamed a lot. I yelled some obscenities. You blankly blank, Don. You, you blankly blank. You better get your blankly blank down here. You better get down here. If you don't get down here, I can't tell you what I'm going to do to you. And watch the whole thing go up in flames. The fifth year, it sort of was kind of over. I mean, I think that it was, it had run its course. This is the story of a police drama that tantalized a generation. I said this many times before, the Beatles must have felt the same way. It's something like, wow, we're doing something special. This is the inside story of Miami Vice, the E! True Hollywood story. The dream of the as television legend goes, the hip 80s cop drama Miami Vice was the brainchild of a music video obsessed television executive. His name was Brandon Tartikoff, former vice president of drama series at NBC, Michelle Bruston. I had just had a pitch. It was about a disc jockey, Private Eye. And I said, you know, there really is something about music with all the videos going on. And I had just seen American Gigolo with Richard Gere looking, you know, fabulous in all his Armani's with great, uh, really uh, state-of-the-art screen cutting uh, techniques. And everybody said, terrific, you know, we really ought to do a show like that. And Brianna said it should be like a cop show or a private eye. I said, yes. And I said, we should get... Tony Yurkovich to do it. Anthony Yurkovich was a writer on hit shows such as Starsky and Hutch and the Emmy Award winning Hill Street Blues. Yurkovich and Universal Executive Kerry McLuggage met with Tartikoff and his staff. Brandon handed him this piece of paper which said MTV Cops and it was like Everybody went, of course. Yurkovich started toying with a concept, a gritty police drama that exposed the underbelly of drug trafficking in southern Florida. Meanwhile, Carrie McLuggage, who was in charge of the project at Universal, suggested an unusual choice for executive producer. I got the call from Carrie, who said, you know, what would you guys think if we brought Michael Mann in on this? And we just went crazy because everybody had wanted to get Michael back into television at that time. I am a filmmaker at heart. I, I think it's the greatest most plastic medium in the modern age. 40-year-old Michael Mann earned critical acclaim as the director of the 1979 TV movie The Jericho Mile and the 1981 big screen feature Thief. TV guide writer Tim Williams. Thief really looks like an extended music video and it has a real touch with um, the use of music, fitting that with the images of the movie. Whether it's performance or words or language or music, or it's all part of the same whole to me. Like Yurkovich, Mann worked on the 70s cop show Starsky and Hutch with David Soule and Paul Michael Glazer. Michael Mann was at the inception of Starsky and Hutch was a story editor. You know, he's got a really great eye and he's got, uh, you know, a real uh, 
focus about him. He's uh, very bright, goes after what he wants. What man wanted was creative control over the pilot. Though executives at Universal balked, they signed the deal. They ended up marrying uh, Michael Mann and, and uh, Tony on the project. We got a script, and it was a, um, the densest script I have ever read in my entire life. It was a two-hour script that took forever to read because he had every, every description that was so, it was like reading a novel. The working title of the script was Gold Coast. In the story, a lone wolf cop from New York named Ricardo Tubbs travels to Miami to avenge his brother's death. When he gets there, Tubbs hooks up with undercover narcotics officer Sonny Crockett. It was everything the brass at NBC had hoped for. Almost all the successful shows I developed, they all had terrific first drafts. And this one was really one of the best ones we had ever read. The writing was just fantastic. With a green light from NBC, executive producer Michael Mann and lead writer Anthony Yurkovich set out to find a director for the two-hour pilot. They chose former actor Thomas Carter. Carter starred as Haywood on the basketball drama The White Shadow from 1978 to 1981. After White Shadow, Carter began directing and made a name for himself on Hill Street Blues. I really wanted to do this show because I thought it was an opportunity for me to use another language in television, to speak in a visual language. In the spring of 1984, Michael Mann and the production team moved to Miami. They set up production offices at the Alexander Hotel near South Beach. Sergeant Robert Holscher of the Miami-Dade Police Department was assigned to the project. South Beach was a ghetto, uh, an absolute ghetto. Numerous derelict, uh, closed up, boarded up buildings, uh, a lot of street crime, uh, a number of things that uh, were not very popular in the community. Mann and his production team started to research the underground world of illegal narcotics. I went out and hung out with uh, vice cops. We went to clubs. They pointed out drug dealers to me. Um, they played sort of little visual physical games across the room because because they sometimes knew each other i mean some of these cops weren't undercover they were just strictly uh, you know detectives and so they know who those guys were those guys knew who they were um and so there were there were, there were these little sort of mano a mano games played across the room uh, but it was an interesting world to go into in 1984, executive producer Michael Mann set up shop in a gritty Miami neighborhood to film the pilot for Miami Vice. Mann had a great script and a realistic location, but he didn't have his stars. Then came a casting decision that made TV history. Then it was like an explosive compulsion of a new affection, and Crockett and Tubbs were born. Executives at NBC knew exactly who they wanted for the part of Detective James Sonny Crockett, an undercover officer who lived on a sailboat with his pet alligator, Elvis. Our image was Nick Nolte, the burnt-out cop in 48 hours. Um, in those days, and it was the early 80s, most people who either were film stars or wanted to be would not touch television with a 10-foot pole. So uh, we were somewhat disappointed when um, the possibilities started walking in the door they had better luck with the role of ricardo tubbs when i read it i said oh my god i gotta do this role 34 year old philip michael thomas had starred on broadway he also appeared in the cult film sparkle but thomas was virtually unknown to tv audiences went into los angeles and i auditioned um and they called my manager Kay and said well he's not right for the part and i said they're absolutely crazy there's nobody that can do this part but me i really liked him immediately he was the most gorgeous guy i'd ever seen and um the guys sort of went really really you know and then but they liked him we all liked him fortunately i was called back and that we had the last uh 10 tubs and 10 crockets to read i read with four or five people and was getting ready to leave milt hammerman who was the casting director called ran down the hall and said philip we have one more person we want you to read with and that was don johnson johnson then 34 years old had already been acting in hollywood for over 15 years he appeared in the herod experiment and a boy and his dog but johnson was better known for his wild personal life he had a fondness for girls and booze and had already been married and divorced from actress Melanie Griffith. I had done a terrible pilot with him a few years earlier called Six Pack, which was this country hick show, essentially. And uh, Don was very good in it. He was tremendously overweight at the time, and he walked in, svelte, but nobody saw it. You know, I mean, it was Don, the guy who'd done four pilots. Every time 
a ball player goes to the plate, he doesn't hit a home run. The way I do it is I, I, I this is what I do. I'm an actor. I, it's plain and simple. Um, and I look, and, I, and parts come to me, and I look at them, and if they speak to me, I do them. And um, God knows I, I haven't... Uh, I've made the best choices on occasion. NBC auditioned other actors for the Crockett lead. One of them was former TV patrolman Larry Wilcox. Larry had already done a show for us, Chips, and it was like, as a cop, and it was, why are you going to make Larry Wilcox into a cop again? Which I think is a valid uh, opinion. And it, it really was down to Don in the end. I think ultimately Don had the best mixture of, of elements. Uh, I think he... Um, understood the guy and could play the role. The network agreed, especially after watching Johnson's screen test with Philip Michael Thomas. From the beginning, there was chemistry. You know, that's the thing that Michael Mann had talked about that, that he was looking for. He said, we got to have chemistry. And we had that spontaneous chemistry that just worked. The next actor hired was Sandra Santiago. She was cast as Miami cop Gina Calabresi. I was nervous. But somehow the nervous energy worked for me, and I became Gina at that moment. And I walked in, I, they laughed in a very inappropriate place. <laughs> but then I think that's why I got the role, because <laughs> I, I did something weird, and I guess what, that's what they liked. The supporting roles of Sergeant Stan Switek and Larry Zito went to actors Michael Talbot and John Deal. Their partnership began the day Talbot and a studio limo driver waited outside Deal's Los Angeles apartment. It's kind of early because we're trying to get that first flight to Miami. Yeah. So we go down and the teamster gets out and he goes up and he starts on this door. And it's, what was it, 7 a.m., something like that? He's knocking, he's looking at me and he's going, you know, he keeps knocking. He finally comes back down the car and says, I don't know, there's no answer. I said, well, he's got to be in there. I mean, if this is what, you know, so he goes back up. I said, start banging on the door. So he's banging on the door. And finally, the knucklehead comes to the door. Yeah? <laughs> oh, that's right. I got to go to Miami, you know. In the spring of 1984, a hip new police drama rolled into Miami, Florida, complete with tough cops, gorgeous girls, and cool clothes. When you walked in, you had, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of clothes, and you're putting on, you said, oh, my God, they're paying me to do this. After arriving in Miami, the cast got acquainted. John Deal and Michael Talbot met their female counterparts, Sandra Santiago and Olivia Brown, who played detectives Gina Calabresi and Trudy Joplin. All remember the first day they met the show's leading men. Don and Philip were like the most gorgeous guys I had ever met, just drop dead gorgeous. Philip was a little more um, shy. Well, I always thought he had three first names. Philip, Michael, and Thomas. Yeah. I thought that was kind of interesting. In struts Don, and he was walking in as a star. <laughs> and uh, I knew he was someone to uh, reckon with at that point. Usually, uh, for the in the first little while, I don't worry about whether they like me or whether I like them. I concentrate on what the characters are doing. Mm. And, uh, and if, you know, we happen to, to strike up a friendship and and uh, and have a relationship on a personal level, then that's great. In the spring of 1984, the cast started a rigorous crash course in Miami law enforcement. We went out and we watched a uh, bus. We um, practiced firearms, uh, just talked about various and sundry things that would happen in, in situations that would, you know, would go down. Uh, we had um, uh, some of the uh, police officers that would train us. We learned everything that you can possibly learn without being a real police officer. Sergeant Robert Holscher of the Miami-Dade Police Department took care of the filmmakers. I insisted that we actually go out to the range and they shoot the state of Florida qualification course for law enforcement officers. Then they could realistically portray on television what a veteran officer would do in a given circumstance. In addition to weapons training, the actors playing the female detectives learned the idiosyncrasies of the world's oldest profession. They dressed Sandra and I up as hookers and they took us out on the street on the real streets of Miami, and we each were given a real cop to work with. And the funny thing is, we got all the men stopped for Olivia and I. <laughs> and Olivia and I would, you know, we'd look at each other and we'd go, you know, I think it's, an, I think we've done enough homework. It's time to go home. <laughs> well, I mean, every actor always says, well, to get into this part, you know, I went and I was in jail for a month, or I went to right. Tibet up on the mountain and I studied and I became. Yeah whatever right right so no that's that's uh, but we had a good time doing it 
John got to play with the sirens in the car and stuff. And wee -oo, wee -oo. Yeah. And they had fun. Executive producer Michael Mann and director Thomas Carter made sure the pilot was visually stunning. It was a very difficult show to shoot, but a lot of fun to shoot. I had a lot of night shooting, so that's expensive. It takes time to light. Uh, it takes time to shoot. Uh, but once we got it, once you got it on film, it gave me a chance to give a kind of a glow and a kind of a, uh, a touch of glamour even to a cop show. NBC executives, however, were not impressed. The network liked the show that they thought, but they would get the dailies back and they weren't quite sure what they were seeing. They didn't know quite what I was after. They were particularly disturbed by Crockett's realistic look. The very first day of dailies, he's in a three-day-old beard, you know, and his hair was greasy because he had been on this undercover assignment. Jeff Sagansky jumped up, ran upstairs, called the studio crazy about how bad this guy looked. Mann tried his best to calm the nervous network executives. Michael Mann was a protector of me in the time when the, when the, when the network didn't understand what I was trying to do. Of course, when they saw the show put together, when they saw it all cut together, they were, they were ecstatic. I mean, it was great. The heart of the MTV Cops concept was always the music. Mann and Carter turned to Czechoslovakian-born musician Jan Hammer to compose an original score for the pilot's theme and background music. Michael wanted me to go ahead and do it, and I wrote, I think, three or four new pieces. And I kept, you know, sending it to him, and we were talking about it. Well, what happened in the end was we used the original piece of music that I played him when, <laughs> played him when we first met. The production wrapped in the summer of 1984. Mann and Carter showed an early version of the two-hour pilot to NBC. I went to see the rough cut, um, which Brandon never went and looked at rough cuts. And the next morning, he called me in to ask me if there were any videos in it. And I said, well, it's like one long video, so you don't have to worry. NBC showed the pilot to random audiences in order to gauge its appeal. The feedback was encouraging. They said that when, when it was reviewed by everybody across the board... I mean, across the board, it was like thumbs up, thumbs up. This is fabulous. This is fantastic. All that was missing was a title for the show. The script was initially called Gold Coast. And then they came up with this title, Miami Vice. We were all very concerned about it. So what we would always do, we test titles. And no one liked Miami Vice, because I guess the public couldn't say that they liked a show with the title Vice in it, you know? I mean, because it would make them look like uh, they were uh, not didn't have the proper family values. So nobody really wanted to use that title, and, uh, and that became an ongoing uh, conversation, but of course it ended up being Miami Vice. Executives in Los Angeles traveled to New York for a meeting with network president Grant Tinker. The New York crowd just sort of didn't get it, and Grant Tinker looked at us, because we all liked it, the young crowd, you know, at that time. <laughs> the, um, uh, Grant Tinker just said, look, it may be a bit overproduced, that was his words, but he said, you can't go wrong with Tony and Michael, don't worry about it. On September 16th, 1984, the introduction of Crockett and Tubbs kicked off the two-hour premiere of Miami Vice. In the beginning, it was like we were almost arch enemies, you know. I'm New York, I'm Miami, you know. The boat, he thought that I was a real drug dealer. Freeze! And I said, I'm a cop. So we, it, it, it was Butch Cassidy and Sundance Kid. On September 28, 1984, a flashy new cop show with a hardcore title debuted on NBC. I knew that a show with a title like my Vice, I was in trouble. Following its Sunday night premiere, NBC ordered 22 episodes of Miami Vice and moved the show to Friday nights. The only question was whether executive producer Michael Mann could sustain the show's level of excellence. He turned to production designer Jeffrey Howard. A lot of the look of the show was inspired by the location. I mean, Miami is a sensuous environment, a wash in cool pastels, and it, it's buoyed by you know, this tidal wave of, of wealth. Mann also hired a special crew of directors, producer Richard Brams. What we were looking for was young, fresh, hip talent. They could be one year out of film school, and if the reel looked right, we'd work with them. Director Leon Achazo. Uh, I was just kind of like puzzled, why me? But I think that's the secret of the show, and that was a secret of the success, the fact that they picked real, you know, they film directors and, and real odd 
kind of uh, choices. One of those odd choices was former TV cop turned director Paul Michael Glazer. I really liked what Michael had done. I mean, it was a real interesting take on Miami to get into all the pastels, um, the cutting, the uh, use of music. It was probably the most contemporary uh, uh, series uh, being shot then. Fashion editor of W Magazine, Merle Ginsburg, witnessed the impact Miami Vice had on style and fashion. I think Miami Vice was probably the precursor to Casual Fridays. Suddenly you did start to see, particularly when it got warmer, guys wearing the t-shirt, the jacket, maybe going beltless. The short hair that had been the long hair gave way to a little grown out look, a little more stubble. Fashion consultant Mario Argiro. The first project was um, uh, let's make Don Johnson look the best and then everybody else came after. Uh, he was known to have a temper tantrum. Yeah, he had, uh, he got a lot of, uh, <laughs> a lot of people upset. But I guess that's, that was his character. He had, he had a strong position, so, and I guess that's what made him so, so popular. By the fifth episode, Miami Vice was hot. So hot, in fact, that Rolling Stone magazine sent reporter Emily Benedek to cover the phenomenon. They hit a nerve in the culture at that time. I think they somehow managed to find the line between showiness and money and power and sort of reality and spirituality at the same time that, that caught people's attention and made them feel alive. Vice in the 80s took advantage of the you know, free will and lifestyle and, and spend, spend, spend and money and flash and glamour. With 22 episodes to film, the cast and crew hunkered down for the long haul. For some reason it took myself and Michael Talbot a long time to find a place. I finally found this gorgeous duplex in Coconut Grove, but it was really expensive. And at that time, I was trying to be conservative. <laughs> so, and he hadn't found a place, so I said, you want to be my roommate? She made the mistake of uh, splitting a uh, condo with me. They had a huge house. I mean, you know, it, it was really great. She's part. great. It's great big place. She's very sweet. But one cast member wasn't happy in Miami. Gregory Sierra, who played Lieutenant Lou Rodriguez, announced he was leaving the show. After three shows, Sierra's character was written out of the series, and a new lieutenant was brought in. 37-year-old Edward James Olmos was a critically acclaimed actor best known for his work in the Latin-infused Broadway musical Zoot Suit. This was the first television program that gave me a non-exclusive contract and a creative control contract over my character. Olmos wasted no time making clear what creative control was all about. When he arrived on the set of Miami Vice and saw the office of his character, Lieutenant Castillo, almost flipped they had all kinds of stuff on my desk i said take everything off and they said excuse me i said i want it clean excuse me nothing on the desk nothing no a bottle of anison please because you're giving me a headache almost was not the only one developing a headache don johnson was not amused with almost his unusual acting style we would do the rehearsal and finally the director said um, okay we're ready to go let's go and so i'd shut the door and Don, after four or five times of doing it, he said, no, no, Eddie, leave the door open. Uh, I don't want to have to deal with the door. I said, I'm sorry, Don, but it's not going to work that way. Um, I need the door shut. And you're going to knock to come into my office. And he says, oh, we're going to see about that. And he left. He left for about an hour and a half. The whole production shut down. Johnson eventually returned to the set, but only after he was informed about Olmos's special contract. So... We shut the door, and the camera's director says, roll. Well, he comes into the door, and if you see the very first episode, you'll see him throw the door. He knocks on the door, and it's a boom, boom, boom. And the door swings open, and it's one of these Venetian blinds like this, and it swings against the wall, and blam, 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 blam. And he comes in, and he says, and he says his lines. And, uh, you know, that's how the guys... And it was kind of like with an attitude from the reality of what our characters were fighting under. And I looked at him for one split second. And I looked down and I said, well, and I, and I answered his question looking away. And I never looked again at him for eight shows. Not only did Olmos look away from the actors, he mumbled his lines. What's the old thing in acting class if you start talking very softly? People are going to strain to hear what you're saying. You have to know your character, and, and story drives everything. That was the most interesting part of Miami Vice, were the stories at that time 
were very uniquely done. One of those unique early episodes featured a wife-beating arms dealer, played by a then-unknown actor named Bruce Willis. We came back in from shooting, and I looked over at the bar, and there was Bruce Willis. So I went over to the bar, and I, he, I knew he was in the show, because we had that scene and the shooting and stuff, and so he says, hey, want a drink? And I, so I said, sure. So we, we sat there, we had a couple of pops, and he was telling how he was a bartender in New York, and you know, we just briefly, you know, sat there for half an hour, had a couple, of, like I said, a couple of pops, and then I went up to the room, and we all had to get up the next day and go to work, and that was my uh, encounter with greatness, I guess. In addition to featuring future superstars like Willis, executive producer Michael Mann always searched for people who would add some real-life grittiness to Miami Vice. In 1984, Miguel Pinero was signed by the producers. Pinero played the recurring role of a drug dealer named Calderon. Pinero was also an ex-convict with incredible talent. Miguel Pinero was a Puerto Rican man who wrote his way out of Sing Sing with a, with a very controversial play called Short Eyes. He did, you know, plays, he, uh, he wrote poetry, he was a wonderful actor. He uh, yet remained very close to a hardcore criminal life that he never abandoned. Michael Mann enlisted Pinero to write one of the most memorable episodes of Miami Vice, titled Smuggler's Blues. Well, I think it was Michael's idea, the idea of Glenn Fry coming in and, uh, and not only uh, using his song, but also having him perform, having him play the lead. The episode earned Glazer an Emmy nomination as a director. It was one of 15 nominations Miami Vice received following its first season. Edward James almost won for Best Supporting Actor, but the rest of the night was a disappointment. Tom O'Neill is author of the Emmys. On Emmy night... Miami Vice suffered humiliating defeat after humiliating defeat. When the smoke cleared the next day, the Los Angeles Herald Examiner was trying to figure out what happened. And the best it could figure was the conservative Emmy voters simply were not going to embrace a show that celebrated hedonism, violence, sex and drugs. In 1985, after an impressive first season, the cast and crew of Miami Vice were ready to do it again. I think it's going to be more, more of a hit than last year because people are aware of the quality of art that we're bringing to the medium. In the summer of 1985, Emmy-nominated director Paul Michael Glazer was brought back to direct the first episode of the second season. I went to Michael and I, I said, you know, I guess, you know, in that you have a hit on your hands, you're probably going to want to start with a two-hour opener. And he said, yeah. Rock icon Gene Simmons of KISS fame was cast as a Miami drug dealer. My scene was shot uh, on a boat, and I was in the middle of a tour, so I only had time to fly in and do my scenes and then fly out. Uh, Simmons hadn't done much at all as an actor, so it was a novel experience for him. It was a little bit like taking him to school. Veteran actor Pam Greer was also brought in. Greer played Philip Michael Thomas's love interest. Valerie is a police detective and uh, was the girlfriend of Ricardo Tubbs. Anybody's going to have some good chemistry with him. He's fine. <laughs> Look at those eyes. Look at the body. Come on. Shooting for the first episode of season two got off to a shaky start. Got like three or four cameras all set up. And I say, okay, tell Don we're ready. And Don didn't want to come out of his trailer. He was, I don't know what was happening then that day, but he was, he was taking his time. I'm waiting and I'm waiting and waiting and finally I just hit the roof and I screamed a lot. I yelled some obscenities. Says, blankety blank, Don, you, you blankety blank, you better get your blankety blank down here. You better get down here. If you don't get down here, I can't tell you what I'm going to do to you. You better get down. I'm screaming and I'm finally the door of the trail. He comes out, he goes, why is that? He gets in the boat and, uh, and he starts combing his hair. <laughs> Just want to strangle him. Being late became a competition for Johnson and Philip Michael Thomas. First assistant director, Marty Schwartz. This is what assistant directors go through all through their life, is waiting for actors. So as a joke, one day, you know, I had two walkie-talkies in my hand, and I went up to Don and Philip, and I said, here, guys, I'm going to give you each a walkie-talkie, and then I'll count to three over the walkie-talkie, and you can both come out at the same time. I, I hope anybody that works with me or has worked with me will say that... Uh, uh, this guy shows up, he comes to play every day. And, uh, you know, and the, as, the, as the guys say, uh, you know, the difference between a pro and, a, and an amateur is the pros play hurt. You know, and you can, you know, you've got to learn how to play hurt. Despite the on-set behavior of the two leading men, shooting wrapped on time. A few days later, on September 9, 1985, the cast took off on a nationwide promotional tour. 
and they flew us to Chicago for Miami Vice Day. And when we got off the jet, I couldn't believe it. It was like a sea of people I'd never seen. Miami Vice Day in Chicago was one of the most fantastic moments uh, in the show for me because of the thousands of people was the roar and thunder of people as we drove you know down the street like i had never encountered male groupies before and grown men were coming up to me and touching me and falling to the floor and crying thousands of people would come out screaming and yelling signs in chicago and uh i thought that was a little odd myself when you get to be uh um uh, as popular as Miami Vice got to be and uh, the surrounding publicity of of all the cast members and myself included um, th that's a uh, it took them a while to understand that uh, th that the that the publicity surrounding all of that stuff it was is part of a machine that has very little to do with me and very little to do with reality as the cast learned to handle their new fame, the show's star, Don Johnson, prepared for his directorial debut. Don, you know, did his homework and uh, he knew what he wanted. Uh, he was, um, you know, astute enough to rely on the people around him to help him. And, um, and he did a really good job. That was, I think the episode he directed was, was one of the best episodes that year. The story revolved around Sonny Crockett and a nemesis from his past, played by Watergate burglar G. Gordon Liddy. His wardrobe was a white jacket. And um, we're talking about how we're going to do the scene, and he runs off in the woods, and he goes, well, I'd never wear this white jacket. I'd get caught. And I just off the top of my head, I said, you did get caught. And he looked at me and I thought, this is the end. <laughs> he just like laughed. You know, we moved on. Following the episode that featured Liddy, Miami Vice reeled in another big fish as a guest star, pop music legend Phil Collins. He was very excited about being on the show. Yeah, Phil Collins was very hot at the time, his music. And they used some of it in that episode, I believe, didn't they? Mm -hmm. And... Uh, I don't know, we just had a great time, plus all the overtime we made. Miami Vice ended season two at number eight in the Nielsen ratings. As Vice entered its third season in the fall of 1987, executive producer Michael Mann stepped away from the series. He started a new police drama based in Chicago called Crime Story. Mann turned over the lead writing duties to producer Dick Wolf. Wolf, who went on to create the legal drama Law and Order, focused on real-life current events as backdrops for episodes of Miami Vice. That was the opening show of the third uh, season, and it was Liam Neeson playing an Irish terrorist. That was a really good, strong third season opener, and it did, it did sort of change the tenor of the show from being totally style to uh, dealing with a real issue. Despite unconventional guest stars, the ratings fell in season three. One of the show's regulars, John Deal, decided it was time to get out of Miami. I wasn't really happy. I mean, that wasn't just because of the show. I mean, that's it had a lot to do with me, too. I think it started the show and the shows, too, that I wasn't happy. And so, because it was just so, you know, for me, it was just a little to do, and I wanted to do, to do a play or I wanted to do something. So. So it had, it had mostly to do with me, not really with the show at all. In his last episode on Vice, Deal's character Zito is murdered by drug dealers. Zito's body is found by his longtime friend and partner Switek, played by Michael Talbot. It was an emotional moment for both actors. Zito went under, yeah, under deep. Uh, under, deep, deep under, <laughs> yeah. Six feet under. No, but it was a great show because yeah. John got to be highlighted a little bit and, uh, and he got to do what he liked to do. In 1987, Miami Vice began its fourth season, but the magic was gone. A weak storyline resulted in even weaker episodes that left millions of loyal fans disappointed. I thought the whole time that it was a joke because they gave me the script and the script said that I got taken away by aliens. After four years in Miami, the long nights and cross-country logistics started to take its toll on Miami Vice. The writing staff was in uh, California. The editing was being done in California. Production was in Miami. The three-hour time difference, it's kind of exhausting because uh, it stretches into a workday that went from about 6 or 6.30 in the morning if you were on the West Coast uh, till normal closing. So it was, uh, they were long days and... Uh, it was not quite as clear-cut sometimes as to what we would be doing on a day-to-day -day basis. There were a lot of changes, and it was a little wacky at times. 
I went, oh my God, what are they doing? You know, it's just so absurd. The writing started to fluctuate. One of the more ridiculous episodes of the season featured the godfather of soul, James Brown. He came in, did a really bizarre show. He's playing the part of the leader of the aliens. Nobody could understand James Brown speaking, so they were like, they couldn't tell James, like, you know, well, let's try it again. Because it seems that every take, James Brown had a thing. And I remember just how serious they were for, for that one little thing. Meanwhile, the female stars lobbied writers to beef up their characters. Every chance I had, I would, when are you going to write me an episode? You know, nagging them to death. We were like the two only women on the show. And, um, and I kept trying to tell Sandra, Sandra, this show is about the guys. You know, you and me, <laughs> forget it. We are supporting cast. I never could understand why they couldn't add just Olivia and I, you know. We look good, you know. <laughs> Something happened along the way. The show became very male-dominated. One male in particular, Don Johnson, was ready to parlay his success on Vice into a film career. I'm in Stowe, Vermont, making a feature film right now, and it's kind of chilly up here. That's, uh, that's why I've got these scarves and sweaters and stuff like that. I even wore socks for you today, babe. <laughs> Still, Miami Vice made it through season four. Ratings were down, but the show continued to win its Friday night time slot. But as Vice entered its fifth season, the show took on a more serious tone that left loyal fans scratching their heads. Towards the end, I kind of didn't like the look as much. A lot of dark blues and purples. And we were getting away from the pastels. I think they were just trying to, it was like anything else, you know, reinvent itself. Fifth year, it sort of was kind of over. I mean, I think that it was, it had run its course. It was very emblematic of a certain period in the 80s. In 1989, NBC decided that the fifth season of Miami Vice would be the last. It was a sad moment, you know, for at that particular time. I personally wish that it would have gone on. You know, I think we, we I don't think we even touched the sur surface of the possibilities if we would have gone on. I guess I think we found out just this way that all actors find out you listen to rumors first and then you just get the the final call i never got a letter from nbc or michael mann or anybody saying you're canceled it's over get out by such and such a date and we had a, a some big rap party and that was basically it i think it was a combination of burnout on everyone's part and don wanting to move on to be a movie star but the producers may have had their own reasons for calling it quits. We were in the process of having 100 shows. They said that we had done enough shows to syndicate, and it was going to end, and it was a sad moment. On April 27, 1989, the cast of Miami Vice shot their last scene and bid farewell to a show that defined the 1980s. We, I believe, really loved working with each other and had a good time. And so it was a very heartfelt feeling about, hey, I'm, I'm going to miss you, you know, and that was for everybody. We left at the height. They could have ran that show for a little bit longer, but at the time, it was the right thing to do. In 1989, after five seasons on the air, the cast of Miami Vice faced the realities of life after a hit TV show. With Miami Vice, you had uh, two actors who now, because the show was so hot, were going to be identified with these roles probably forever. In the early 1990s, Don Johnson starred in a slew of films with nominal success. In 1996, Johnson returned to Friday Night Television with the hit cop show Nash Bridges as both star and executive producer. You know, clearly I'm the same guy, just 10 years older, you know, so um, um, I think the, uh, I, I think that probably there's some, you know, residual character traits because of who I am. Like Johnson, Philip Michael Thomas found it difficult to leave his vice character behind. Acting roles were hard to come by, and the one-time heartthrob became a pitchman for the Psychic Friends Network. Then, former partner Don Johnson came to the rescue. Johnson created a recurring role for Thomas on Nash Bridges. I worked on Nash Bridges, and he said, Man, every time somebody sees me, they expect to see you. And I said, Well, every time they see me, they expect to see you, you know. The reunion was short-lived. CBS canceled the series in 2001 after five seasons. For the actor who played Lieutenant Castillo, the years spent shooting Miami Vice will always be special. I had a tremendous time in Miami, and I, I liked my position because I could come and go. Uh, I could go off to do a movie, 
and then come back. So I had to the best of everything I could possibly want from this kind of a position. And for the rest of the cast, life after Vice goes on. If you went to a big city or New York or wherever, you know, you try to get another job, then people would say, hey, Miami Vice, you know, that's great. Uh, and then you, you realize what it, what it meant to a lot of people. And I love that, that I did, had this experience with Miami Vice. I mean, it's kind of historical in a way. I still get recognized. This old lady came up to me the other day. She goes, you know what? You're the girl. You're the girl. And I go, from Miami Vice? She goes, no, that used to waitress at Cantor's. I was like, yeah, you're right. That hits me. For me, Miami Vice is probably the most important show that I've ever done. And I pray that one day I could duplicate it. And I also would pray for anybody who is an artist to keep believing in themselves and maybe one day they can be a part of something that was so magnificent. Elvis is still alive. You go, Elvis. Oh, my God. He's not some shoes. I was concerned. Being from the Bronx, never worked with an alligator. It was a little crazy. It was the first time and hopefully the last ever worked with an alligator. One day he got loose and I was on the bridge. We were on the bridge and you're talking about Jesse Owens. I was gone.